Kings, Queens, Nerds, and Geeks, Powder Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria. Now guys, I'd like to make a quick apology for um, my lack of posting these couple days, my minimal posting. Guys, I've um, I have been having trouble sleeping lately, I've been having some, and I think I'm slowly developing insomnia, and I have to see a doctor about it, and I'm afraid to, because the doctors here are not very good. And, um, I, I, I'm sorry guys if I'm causing delay, but I figured I'd start the next video off with the next chapter of Fallout Questress. This is my most viewed video series on, um, on my channel. So, let's get on with it, shall we? So, I believe where we left off is that... I believe the last chapter was about um, Little Pip actually got to hook up uh, they, uh, did a little mattress mambo with a homage um, they went on a quest and to um, sorry I got lost in thought I'm still kind of tired I haven't slept last night um, I, I know they went on a quest to go uh, see who Watcher is, which turned out to be Spike the Dragon, and that's where it left off. So we're about to find out what the hell's going on. So here we go, back to the story. Dragon. Really big, gigantic, enormous purple dragon with green spines and with claws and spikes and very, very sharp teeth and a huge mouth that just promised not to eat us. Well, that was a start. I could hear the voices of my companions around me, but I couldn't turn my head. My gaze remained locked on the dragon staring at us. I couldn't move. I could barely breathe. Calamity, Velvet Remedy whispered urgently. Don't shoot it. I, uh, I weren't planning to, Calamity hissed back. Girl, you gotta let that go. Pilate cried out and flew away, wings flapping with the sound of a crackling fireplace. Interesting, mused a deep rumble from Steel Hoof's armor. I'd say he's a damn sight more than interesting. He said he was Spike, Steel Hoof said curiously. He didn't say he was Watcher. The dragon's gaze locked on me. He raised a very sharp claw the length of my whole body. Addressing me, Spike, the fully grown dragon, asked, They do realize I can hear them, right? Little Pip, Velvet Remedy, Calamity, please don't be afraid. Spike smiled, showing way too many sharp teeth. Dragons shouldn't smile when they're trying not to be intimidating. You're welcome in my house, on one condition. Watcher was setting conditions. That would have irked me, but this was his home. And Watcher was a dragon. Dragons got to set whatever conditions they wanted. I was fully expecting something along the lines of don't steal, hoof through, or touch my treasure. I was not prepared for the dragon to point at steel hooves with one lethal claw and say, that stayed outside. Watcher had a problem with ghouls? That did irk me. Perhaps not quite so much as it would have after meeting Ditsy Doo and before learning about Rotting Tail, but it still um, bothered me. I think I get the idea of why that is. Um, I I'm just going to make my opinion before it's made clear why. Um, I believe the reason why Spike doesn't want him in there because he was there before this all happened, so he probably understands why. Or, here's another theory, he knew Steel Hoos from the, in the past, and he just disliked him, and maybe had a thing for Rarity, which he had too. So who knows? We don't ever know. Who, what, what Watcher or Spike's intentions are, so we're about to find out. He's with us, I insisted, putting my hoof down. I breathe fire. Spike countered, winning the argument. I turned to Steel Hooves. You okay with this? After everything, part of me was ready to turn my back and Watcher and just walk away if Steel Hooves said no. I'll be fine, Steel Hooves answered. I felt unexpectedly relieved. Besides, I won't be alone. Steelhoof's armor sheathed tail jabbed towards the Sky Bandit. Pyrolite had taken shelter inside and was furtively peeking her head through one of the windows. 
Apparently, flying into the home of Equestria's largest predator was a bit much to ask of our new feathered companion. I nodded to Steelhoofs, then turned back to the dragon. Okay. Velvet Remedy was more gracious and diplomatic, giving Spike a courteous bow. Thank you, Mighty Spike, for allowing us into your house. She barely paused before choosing the words she had used. Do dragons blush? Spike seemed to. He glanced back into the darkness behind him. Well, it's really more of a cave, but I've fixed it up enough that it feels like a house. I'm sure you did splendidly, Velvet Remedy flattered. Spike turned. We all ducked as his massive tail swung around and led us into the cave. We followed, all except for Pyrelight and Steel Hooves. A pony in my head stopped insistently, wanting to know why I had just been required to leave a friend outside. A dragon. Watcher was a dragon. The awe and I'm about to get eaten dread was washing away, and I was surprised to find that what Tip hoofed in to replace it was anger. It's delightful, proclaimed Velvet Remedy. I didn't know a dragon's cave could be so... homey. She turned around, well, taking in the scattered piles of gemstones surrounding an immense circular bed it is sunk into the decor. floor. <laughs> and there are so many books. You must be a collector. Oh, books. That could be the walls easy. were lined with bookshelves, many and of which were it's... full. The cave continued on into the darkness through a massive fissure in the back wall. There are twilights, Spike said almost reflexively. Then, with a touch of sadness, he corrected himself. Were twilights. Twilight sparkle? I asked, seeking to confirm my suspicions. I was already sure of the answer even before the dragon nodded. I was thinking of the audio message Amage had played for me, the one Rarity had left Twilight Sparkle. Twilight Sparkle had not gone to Pinkie Pie when she ran out of room for her books. She had started storing them here. A single terminal sat on a pedestal near the bed, an only slightly fancier model than that found everywhere else in the wasteland. A cable snaked deeper into the cave from the machine's back. I had been expecting something much more like homages set up at the MASEBS. The little pony in my head was stomping more insistently. Finally, feeling just a touch cross, I bluntly asked, Why did I tell Steelhoofs to stay outside? Um, you didn't. I did, Spike said, as if I needed to be reminded of the flow of events. The day a Steel Ranger steps hoof in my house is the day I eat canned food. The oh, ominous growl of his voice I made it so very wrong. clear what can he was talking about. Okay, Spike didn't have a problem with ghouls. He had a problem with Steel Rangers. Or was it with the Ministry of Technology in general? For someone who spent his days jumping around Sprite Bots, that would be a surprising attitude. Velvet Remedy was still looking around, expressing yeah, admiration that the dragon today? was just soaking up. I suspect it had been a very long time since some pony had complimented him on anything, even something as simple as how well kept his books were. Leave it to Velvet Remedy to know just what to say. Particularly since I was feeling much less diplomatic. I bit my lip. I was seething just under the surface, and I couldn't put my hoof on why. I wondered if my emotional state was some sort of delayed PTM withdrawal, or if I was just more tired than I realized. I'd spent most of the last four weeks, ever since leaving Stable 2, in a state of physical or mental exhaustion. But Amish had pulled me through a miraculous and multi-orgasmic recovery. I should be in far more control than I was suddenly feeling. Oh my god, back with the sexual innuendos! Okay, for one... Okay, that one was really unnecessarily needed to be said, to be honest. I'll be honest right there. That innuendo was not needed in this conversation. This is not needed in this train of thought, unless this is actually how Little Pip's mind works, which means it's like mine. So, which I'm going to love this character even more, or probably just start hating this character, because sometimes, you know, people who are alike start to hate each other, but sometimes people who are like love each other, so I might be just like Little Pip. I looked away from Spike, staring at his huge Maybe. bed. It did look comfortable. Plush with pillows and blankets, I'd even say it looked heavenly. I blushed hotly and shivered for something that was not related to cold as my brain conjured up mental images of what I could do with homage. Oh god! Homage, homage, AGAIN! That. I looked away, clearing my throat. Spike took the sound as a call for attention. Oh, right, uh, the black opal. He stretched out a purple paw, its expanse bigger than my whole body. If he would, please. 
Carry your pony at your service, I thought bitterly as I floated out the black opal and set it into his palm. Why did you want it so badly? I asked. He was a dragon. He was no more able to view the memory than an earth pony could. And I doubted that any pony had ever made a recollector in his current size. Because, he answered simply, it was the last time Equestria's greatest mares and my closest friends were happy. With a sadly nostalgic note, he added, all of us, in the same place, at the same time, and happy. Twilight Sparkle, Rarity, Pinkie Pie, Applejack, Rainbow Dash, Fluttershy. They were, in Spike's own words, the greatest heroines of Equestria. The mares who epitomized the six most important virtues of pony kind. The mares whose friendship had the power to change the world. And it's true. How did it go wrong? It was Velvet Remedy who asked, but I think we all needed to know. Spike was slow to answer, and much of what he told us I had already expected. These ponies, my dearest friends, were not without their own problems. They had their failings, even when they were young. But their virtues let them stand up to any hardship, and their friendship gave them a strength that they could never have as individuals, Spike said nostalgically. But then the smile... Oh, sorry you guys know before I like to keep wondering what the sound of that was, that was my cue. I'll faded. Even the greatest people have their flaws. And, when put under pressure or in the right circumstances, those flaws can become cracks. They can break you. And, with the ministries, they weren't together anymore. And they were under pressure all the time. Spike stopped, and then fiercely asserted, Not that everything that went wrong can be laid at their hooves. Not even most of it. We all nodded, listening intently. First, there was the war. Equestria had been at war for over a decade before Luna created the Ministries. War changes everything, Spike informed us passionately. Before that, Equestria had known peace for over a thousand years. We didn't know war. We didn't understand it. Maybe if we'd had a few in the past, we wouldn't have made all the mistakes all at once. The dragon's tail thumped making gems and books and ponies jump. And then there were the ministries themselves, the very epitome of good ideas and noble intentions gone wrong. And How not by do the you fault not of the know mares war? who ran them. Velvet Remedy caught in. How do you not know war? I know this is equestrian, and I know this, but there's always conflict with everything in war. Every universe, there's always a conflict. No matter what, there is always conflict. May have even had conflict, which has been documented before the Earth Ponies, the Pegasi, and the Earth Ponies. Uh, Unicorns, Pegasi, and Earth Ponies were together. They were separate and hated each other. In fact, they fought about it. And there must have been a possibility, probably not even mentioned in it, fighting, but it's probably been thousands of years, that's probably what he meant it. But, you also gotta think about the griffins, too. And you gotta think about the dragons. And you also gotta think about others. Hey, Yakakistan has been gone for a long time, and they almost went to war. You gotta remember that. Changelings, they went into a major battle against the changelings, that should have been a war. That, that, that's what I don't get. How does the question not know war? Inflection in Spike's words that I did not. What do you mean? The mayors of the ministries didn't actually run the ministries? Well, yes and no. Spike pinched the bridge of his nose between two claws, wincing a bit. How can I put this? We waited as the dragon gathered his thoughts. Of the six of them, only two even tried to run their ministries. Those were Twilight Sparkle and Rarity. The others pretty much just threw suggestions at their ministries and hoped for the best. Spike fought for words before finding an analogy he felt was suitable. I found it a rather odd choice myself. Think of the ministries as dressmakers. They have their own ideas of how to make a good dress, but they are beholden to the sporadic demands of their clients. In this case, my friends. The mares who have been put in charge of them, even when those clients don't have the first clue about the art of dressmaking, no matter how good the suggestions may seem, of course you use dress no how brilliant and skilled the dressmakers may be, they can still end up with a nightmare design. 
calamity broke in. Yep. Especially if what you're talking about is more like a committee of dressmakers all competing for their vision. Spike agreed. Democracies tend to make a mess out of everything, Calamity said with clear bitterness. Only time they can act is when they're feeling threatened. I looked at my rust-coated companion, wondering where that had come from. Oh, of course. Suddenly, I was very happy I didn't know more about Pegasi politics. I don't get it, Calamity commented. Why are you hiding in here? Ain't like there's much a dragon needs to hide from. He cocked his head thoughtfully. I mean, a really ticked off or some major, maybe. And that's when I knew why I was mad. His words were like an earthquake, opening a fissure of reason, the anger simmering just beneath the surface. My response was... natural. I erupted. All this time, you've been a dragon. A dragon. All. This. Time. Spike looked at me, startled. Uh, little Pip, Clemity cautioned, please don't upset the really big dragon. Oh God, how can you? I stomped, fuming. This is the most nicest dragon you've ever Do you have any idea how much good you could have done? How many lives you could have saved? I found myself advancing on the dragon in my fury. I would have faced up to the preposterousness of my own actions had I not been blinded by righteous anger. Spike's backing away from me only heightened the absurdity of it. Don't tell me you don't care, I spat. I know you care. You've been watching. One. Let me see the flaw in this. You gotta remember, he's a dragon. Somebody is gonna run from him, yes, but so are the people he's trying to save, and they're gonna be afraid of him no matter what he's gonna do. In the case of a situation, let's say some women are being attacked by raiders, being raped and beaten, and robbed. In and about to be murdered, too. So he goes in to save them. Say that. Say that. Okay? And he goes up to him and says, They see the dragon. They run. But so will the women. And after he's done killing the raiders, what the freaking women are going to do? They're just going to be afraid of him. Think they're going to eat him. No matter what he says, they can't believe him. Why aren't you out there doing something? The Equestrian Wasteland needs someone like you. Spike looked abashed, but insisted. I have my reasons. Reasons? I attacked. Afraid of getting your own claws bloody? Hell, the Ponyville Raiders couldn't have even scratched your scales. But no. You'd rather send a little mare fresh out of the stable with virtually no combat experience into a pit of Raiders where she's more likely to get killed than to save any pony. I was huffing. My mane and tail were in disarray. Part of me seriously wanted to charge Watcher. Maybe with all my telekinesis behind it, my horn could give him a jab he might actually feel. Little Pip. What reasons? What could possibly be more important? I was screaming at the dragon. All the times I had put my own life at risk to help others, and the person who had set me on that path was a nigh-invulnerable dragon. Yet he couldn't be bothered to leave the house. What? You need to polish your gems? Count them? Maybe take a nap? Spike flinched. Seeing that was like dumping fuel on the fire. I opened my mouth and let out a barrage I didn't know I had in me. Enough! Boomed Spike, finally sounding like a dragon. I cringed, suddenly remembering that I was small and probably tasty. The single word Finish slammed ponies. to me in silence. Each gems. The dragon turned away from me, looking to my friends. Do you trust little Pip? E yep said Calamity without hesitation. Yes, I do, chimed in Velvet Remedy. I felt a pang, knowing that I might have hesitated had our places been reversed. While I forgave her, I still felt the pain of her betrayal, no matter how well-intentioned and beneficial it had been. All right, then I will tell Little Pip my reasons, but only Little Pip, and only on the promise that she never tell anyone else, not even you. Why? Velvet Remedy asked politely. I would have demanded an answer. Spike scowled deeply. You've seen memory orbs. You know that there are ponies who can rip a thought from you with their magics, and the so-called goddesses who command the alicorns is telepathic, and through her, so are they. I was struck with a new image of the alicorns as terminals linked to a mainframe, sending and receiving their messages from it, 
and through it. This is how they knew when and how their own had died. Their goddess had observed their death through the alicorn's mind, and then sent the knowledge on to all of the rest. The fewer who know, the smaller the risk that someone might rip that knowledge from you and use it against. He paused before concluding with, Me. I frowned. If Watcher's reason for being Watcher was that dire, then Spike was taking a massive risk just telling me. My outburst alone couldn't be the cause to break 200 years of silence. Or was it an opportunity? Again, I got the impression that the dragon was desperately lonely in his self-imposed exile. On the other hoof, Spike could just be full of horse apples. <coughs> All right, I stated firmly. I'll agree to that condition, but only if your reason is good. Spike contemplated that for a moment, seeming to accept it. He stared to Calamity and Velvet Remedy. And will Little Pip's word that my reason is good be enough for you two without ever hearing what it is? Uh, yeah, yeah, Calamity said, frowning. I trust Little Pip's judgment. If she says you got good enough cause to leave the rest of the folk out on their own, then that's good enough for me. Velvet Remedy nodded. Of course. Then follow me, Little Pip. I have something to show you. The huge purple dragon turned and lumbered further into the cave, passing through the fissure in the wall. I gave Calamity and Velvet Remedy one last look, then trotted after him, nearly needing to gallop to keep up. What am I looking at? I asked for the second time in my life. We had traveled into the center of the mountain peak. I had soon realized we were following the cable from Spike's terminal. And now, I stood in a vast chamber, large enough for the dragon to move around easily. Along the walls were mainframes, half a dozen of them, with gemstones that pulsed with magical energy. They all seemed to be nearly dormant, save for the closest one, which beeped busily. In the center of the room, like a gigantic stalagmite of magic and steel, rose the tapering column of a super mainframe that made DJ Pony's systems look downright quaint. Massive insulated wires ran up the walls from the tops of the mainframes, then swooped across the chamber to attach around the column at a point well above Spike's head. The chamber was a chimney. Staring upwards, I could see far above us a rough circle of the night sky, twinkling with stars. The super mainframe was pointed towards that hole like a colossal magical wand. A Crusader mainframe, Spike answered. Chris. The ultimate arcano-technological mainframe. So oh. powerful it could think for itself. Learn. It could even hold the imprint of a pony's mind. Only three had ever been built, I remembered. One was installed in Sable 29. One went to the Ministry of Awesome. And one... This one... Came here. A platform radiated out of the base from the Crusader like a six-pointed star, each ending in a dais. Upon each dais rested a fine pillow, upon I which sat a single now. piece of jewelry. The one closest to me was... I remember... Oh, shit. I, I almost forgot about that. In one of the chapters that they went at the table 29 and they had to shut off the the um, shut off the, um, the crusader thing whatever sorry I'm still tired I'm still tired anyway back to the story it was a beautiful tiara the other that I could see was clearly a necklace are you I looked at spike suddenly questioning my assumptions is this watcher Spike chuckled. No, I'm Watcher. This is a Crusader mainframe. A very special one. What does it do? I asked, Wait, my curiosity crown? beating down my anger. Necklace. Except let you hack sprite bots and spy on ponies. Something this incredible couldn't be here for a purpose, so... Pedestrian. Is it what I think it is? Right now, nothing, Spike told me. I felt the little pony in my head cry out in disappointment. It's waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting for who? I looked at Spike blankly. Spike seemed to bulwark himself. I sensed the plunge he was about to take frightened him. This is Twilight Sparkle's greatest and most important project. She poured her heart into this. What? In the end, is it? it was more important to her than anything else. Spike trailed off, looking to me as if pleading that I could grasp Barrel, how meaningful his words Jara, were. Necklace. I nodded, waiting for him to continue. I was reserving judgment, 
but already I felt that Spike's reasons were, if not good enough for myself or other ponies, truly of vital importance to him. She commissioned this crusader, and worked on it herself in every private moment she had, creating a mainframe which had cast a very special spell. I blinked, jaw dropping. What? All this? I waved a hoof. Just to cast a spell? Spike glared at me, and I shut up. Not just a spell. A mega spell. One more powerful and more complicated than any other mega spell ever conceived. Twilight Sparkle wouldn't have been able to cast it. The most powerful magical pony born in a thousand years. And she created it. Gardens of Equestria was beyond what even Celestia or Luna could hope to cast. Guardians of Equestria. Confirmed. Right even before... Well, it says Guardians of Harmony, but close enough, right? You know, like... Uh, yeah. So... Gardens of Equestria. Yes, Spike answered. A single spell. A single spell. Powered by the elements of Harmony. Calculated and cast by a magically augmented Crusader mainframe. A single spell that would affect the entirety of Equestria. Cleansing it of radiation and taint, restoring it to the beautiful paradise it was once before the other megaspells twisted and poisoned it. Oh. My. Goddesses. I stared, eyes wide, unbelieving even though I could tell it was true. One spell. One single spell that could fix. Well, not everything. But it would mend the soul of our mortally wounded land. Then why... I asked slowly, an ache building up inside of me. A beautiful, restored Equestria. Why hasn't it been cast? Spike spoke with almost infinite sadness. Because the ponies who can use the elements of harmony are dead. I moved around the Crusader, looking at each element of harmony in return. I stopped when I reached the necklace of the balloon-shaped gemstone. I went to a get-together at Spike's place and brought it, just like you asked. All of my friends were there but you. Twilight Sparkle entrusted you with the element of magic, didn't she? She entrusted me with... all of this, Spike answered. I can't leave. If a band of raiders should make their way into this place while I'm gone, or worse, a troop of steel rangers... He didn't need to say anything more. I can't take the risk that someone might damage or destroy this, Spike said anyway. I have to stay here, keep guard, until I can find the right ponies. I sat down next to the laughter dais, my eyes wet. The raw emotions stirred by what I was seeing and hearing were too much. For nearly two hundred years, Spike admitted morosely, I've been searching out ponies who seemed like they were virtuous, helping them setting them on a path to find more like themselves, all in the hopes of one day finding the right six ponies. Magic, kindness, laughter, generosity, honesty, and loyalty. My heart broke for the dragon. All that time? He gave a bark of hurting laughter. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how hard it is just for a pony to find five friends in this blasted horror of the wasteland. He looked down, his eyes taking me in. Well, actually you do. Does it have to be six? I asked. In all of Equestria's history, there has only been one pony who has ever been able to wield more than one. Trust me, I have a lot of books on the subject. And that was Celestia. She used the power of the elements of harmony to banish the monster her sister had turned into. Only with the elements can magic that powerful be cast. And only Celestia had the ability to use them all. Then, why didn't she... A thought struck me. For that matter, why didn't she just send all the damn zebras to the moon? Because she's dead too, Spike informed me bluntly. And even when she wasn't, she couldn't use them anymore. They were no longer hers to use. I stared up the nearest dais. The tiara, Spike had informed me earlier, was the element of magic. I found myself reminded just how pathetically unmagical I was. For all the raw power I had learned to tap, I was truly a one-trick pony. A dark realization washed over me. It... it's not just us, is it? 
I looked around the diocese and then back to Spike. We're not the right group of friends either. We can't bring Equestria back. I felt my heart tearing. You're still looking. Spike nodded sorrowfully. No, you're not. He snorted in laughter again. Don't feel bad about it, though. You're an amazing pony and you have amazing friends. I have no doubt that the group of you will do a lot more good for Equestria. It's just not your destiny to heal it. Or is it? A beautiful, green, healthy Equestria. Full of life. Just a spell away. You see, this might support my theory from the last chapter about the elements of harmony, after all. That might support, this might support it. Um, I am also, by the way, uh, Oscar, um, I, um, I saw your comments about it, and I, I like your views on things. I do like your views when you comment, so p comment plenty in the comments. Anybody who's watching this, comment plenty. I want you to blow the comment section when you, when you, when you see these things. I want you to tell me everything you're thinking about when you read these, and tell me everything, tell me all your opinions, I don't care what. And here we go. And I was... insufficient. I'd never felt more worthless. Hey, Spike scolded, reading my expression. It's not your fault. Hell, imagine how hard it is to find a pony with the virtue of laughter in the equestrian wasteland. I thought of... Ditsy do and felt a spark of hope. We might be the wrong ponies, but... Maybe I could start Spike on the right path to finding the ones who are. I think I know who you're looking for. <sighs> I swore that I would never speak a word of what Spike had shown me. I almost wished he hadn't. Did she do? The consequences of an enemy learning of what Spike was protecting in this Derby place was no less than the doom of Equestria's uh, I'm gonna cry. It was a heavy secret. I didn't even, even think about that. It. And I was a very small pony. <laughs> On our way back to the others, I noticed something that Spike had unintentionally blocked my view of before. Set high into the wall was a case of glass. In the case were six statuettes. I knew them well. I already had four of my own. I couldn't see them properly, nor could I read their inscriptions without floating myself up to them. I felt that that would be inappropriate. What happened? I asked suddenly. Spike stopped, looking back at me then trailing my gaze up to the display case. I mean, I know what happened to Pinkie Pie, but what happened to the rest of them? Spike's jaw clenched frighteningly. I don't know. You don't know? I mean, you were there, right? I don't know. He repeated, sounding threatening. I took a step back, swallowing hard, suspecting that I had crossed a line and probably destroyed any bonding that had begun in the chamber behind us. I stared at the floor. Oh, uh, of course, you were... here. The dragon's voice boomed with anger and self-incrimination, and regret. I was asleep. Yet again, I found myself staring at the dragon. The huge, purple, powerful dragon who had somehow slept through the apocalypse. I just needed to take a nap. I figured that if anything important happened, someone would wake me up. Spike cried, his voice brimming with self-loathing that made my own self-hatred seem petty and small. I should have been there. I should have been with her. She was my closest friend. She shouldn't have died alone. But instead, I was asleep. I... I'm so sorry, I said, my voice trembling. I put a hoof on his scales in a feeble attempt to comfort him. He was too big to hug. Spike just stood there, unmoving, lost in an ocean of his own regrets. He didn't cry. I suspect that the tears this pain would wring from him had all been banished over a century ago. So, I cried for him. I understood it. This mountain was in the middle of nowhere, days travel from any hint of civilization. It would have been nearly impossible for even the sounds of the mayor's belt to reach this far, easily mistakable as thunder. The flashes of light might have pierced the cave, but after the very first hit, the Pegasus ponies had closed up the sky. When Spike had gone asleep, all his friends were alive. 
Equestria was struggling through the darkest part of its history, but there was hope that it could still pull through. When he woke up, Equestria was gone. His friends were dead. The sky was cloud-locked, and the land below was nothing but blighted, poisonous wastes. I wondered how he had ever been able to sleep again. I just want you to remember, Spike told me as we approached the main room of his house, that the Gardens of Equestria was the real gift that Twilight Sparkle gave to all of us. His voice took on a slightly hard edge. I know that as you travel, as you poke your nose into places and memories, you're going to hear things or learn things about my Twi. But this, what you saw back there, that is the true heart of Twilight Sparkle. I won't forget, I promised. And remember, this is your secret now. And my little breakdown back there, that's a secret too. You breathe one word of that, and I'll eat you, Spike said dourly, then cracked a smirk. Or for that matter, if you make any jokes about a grown guy playing with dolls. Calamity and Velvet Remy looked up at us as we returned. From Velvet's expression, she could tell I had been crying. It's a good reason, I said simply. They both nodded, clearly willing to accept it. An awkward silence fell over the room. Calamity glanced nervously towards the entrance. Somewhere out there were the other Pegasi, a whole civilization that had once been his home. To his family and friends, he was now a Dashite, a traitor. Was he thinking about them? Missing them? Or was he worried what his own kind would do, not to himself, but to his friends, should they catch us up here? Velvet Remedy fidgeted in her saddleboxes, medical kits that had seen far too much use patching up wounds inflicted by violence. The singer and aspiring medical pony, a pacifist by nature, to whom the thought of harming another pony was abhorrent, now wore three weapons, one of them a combat shotgun. She'd stopped speaking to us like we were capable of horrible things because now she knew she could do what we were capable of. Instead, she retreated into a fantasy world that was more of a minefield than she could ever know. Spike. I could almost feel the pain everyone was hiding. Tell us about them, I said, breaking the silence. Everyone turned to me. Twilight Sparkle, Rainbow Dash, Fluttershy, and the others. You knew them, Spike. Tell us about what they were like when they were younger. When they were happy. Tell us of the good times, Spike. Everyone here needs to hear that. Including, if not especially, you. I want to hear this too. Wait, 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 I gasped. She got them to let her go by whining. Calamity was laughing. And give up all them jewels to boot? Spike nodded, a big smile on the dragon's face. I'll have to remember that, Velvet Remedy said with dangerous silkiness. Great, Spike. Calamity muttered, You doomed us all. I clopped my hooves on the cave floor in applause. Tell us another one. This was good. Calamity had cheered up immeasurably at the tale of how Rainbow Dash had stood up against her own for the buffalo. Velvet Remedy had virtually fangasmed over Fluttershy's caring for a sick phoenix. And I could tell that talking about all of them, especially Twilight Sparkle, was doing Spike a world of good. I opened up my saddlebags, pulling out sparkle coals for each of us. One of the bottles had wedged itself against the audio recorder I had found on the cliffside, forcing me to shake it loose. Part of me felt bad that Steelhoofs couldn't be in here with us sharing these memories, but I understood all too much why Spike didn't want a knight of the Ministry of Technology poking around his lair. Instead, I tried to memorize the story so that we could share them with him. Okay, here's another one. This is a story about Twilight Sparkle's first winter wrap-up. What's a winter wrap-up? Calamity asked, opening the sparkle cola I had passed to him. Carrot-flavored liquid erupted in his face. He shot me a look. Oh, come on, I chortled. I owed you that for the Ministry of Awesome. He glowered, then chuckled. Velvet Remedy floated him a cloth to wipe his face. Spike watched us with amusement, waiting for Calamity to dry himself before answering. Well... That's when the ponies of Ponyville will clean up the winter so the spring could start properly. As he looked at us, I could see it dawning on him that none of us had even the slightest clue what he was talking about. Two of us were from stables and had never experienced a winter. Calamity had been an outcast long enough to have been through a few, but only wild winters that wrapped themselves up on their own. 
the Pegasi had long stopped aiding the passing of the seasons. Well, normally in Equestria, one season would be aided to finish neat and tidy by magic, but Ponyville was founded by Earth Ponies, and it was tradition to help wrap up winter the Earth Pony way, without magic. But they had unicorns and Pegasi living there too, Velvet Remedy questioned. So why didn't they use magic? Spike nodded. I thought it was silly the first time, too. The first half dozen times, actually. It wasn't until I visited Philadelphia that I understood. Understood what? I asked. Well, it's more difficult for Earth Ponies, Spike explained. They don't have magic. They don't have wings. A lot of the time, they have to work three times as hard to get half as much done. But they will, without a complaint. You won't find ponies as proud or as stubborn as Earth Ponies. I took Spike's word as the generality they were. I had some realization that none of them were Earth Ponies. Steel. Of course, Earth Ponies were exceptionally innovative. Wait until I tell you the story of when Pinkie Pie chased down Rainbow Dash and a Griffin in a crazy flying machine. They're always looking for a way to do more work easily. That's why Earth Ponies have been the ones to push technological progress. Of course, you probably would never have come up with the wheel if it wasn't for Earth Ponies. I believe it, Calamity agreed. Well, the part about the wheel. I don't much believe no Earth Pony could have kept pace with the Rainbow Dash. I smiled at that. Spike returned to his story. It all started when Twilight waking me up way too early and I told you you are not welcome in here. I turned, knowing that Steelhoves must have walked into the cave. Maybe he overheard our voices and wanted to say something about Earth Ponies. That would certainly fit the proud and stubborn label. Steelhoves was backing into the cave. Not good. Sorry to intrude, the Steel Ranger said, but you have more company. Fry me if you must, but you might want to deal with them first. Calamity's voice was nearly a growl as he said, Them? Four Pegasus ponies, completely entombed in nightmarish black Pegasus enclave armor, flew into the room, landing directly in front of us. Wait, what? Spike reacted immediately. The green-spined purple dragon drew himself up to his full height, snorting flame and spreading his wings wide. You are not welcome here! They stood their ground, although two of them backed up a pony's length. Seems you have some other guests, the lead Anglai Pegasus said casually. They are here at my invitation. You. Are. Not. The lead Pegasus spread his forehooves in a disarming gesture. We're just here to make sure they find their way safely back beneath the clouds, he said amiably. I think we can find our way ourselves. Calamity had lowered into a fighting stance. He kicked a handle below the bit piece of his saddle, a lever that had not been there before Ten Pony Tower. I heard a clicking inside the battle saddle as the ammo type changed. I was certain he had just swapped in armor-piercing rounds. Don't shoot them, Velvet Remedy hissed to Calamity. Let us at least try diplomacy first. Well, looky who it is, one of the female enclave Pegasi called out with a whistle. We got ourselves a Dashite. Not just any Dashite. One of the other metal-clad males spoke up. That's a dead shot Calamity. Horse apples. I heard Calamity mutter under his breath. Wait, what? The lead Pegasus looked between my friend and the Pegasus who had identified him. You sure? Oh yeah. Winner of the best young sharpshooter competition four years running. You don't forget the pony who beat you. Get shot. Calamity whispered, eyes going wide. The leader's compound visor turned towards Calamity, locking him in its glowing, fire-colored glare. Well, I'll be. Decorated military officer to murderous traitor. The gems on his battle saddle's antenna-like weapons began to glow a fierce yellow-orange that matched his visor. Sorry, Dragon, but this changes things. Spike didn't seem to think so. Go while I still let you. The dragon was growing impatient. You seem to forget who's in charge up here, dragon, the leader said, still speaking gently. Now we'll be going as a gesture of goodwill, but we'll be taking that criminal here into custody. He pointed the hoof at Calamity. You seem to forget who's tasty and good with ketchup. Hey now, the mayor in sinister black magically powered armor spoke up again. Look, Dragon, you tell sir, him, you tell him. the reward for this one's head is worth a pretty nice pile of gems, far tastier than any pony. Tell you what, let us take him, the reward is yours. Spike paused. Blinked. Gems? 
Oh no. He wouldn't. Don't do it. Not after everything he just told us about his friends. Especially his friends. Don't. The Pegasus nodded. A lot of gems. A lot of gems. Yep. Spike cocked his head, as if listening to a voice we couldn't hear. You've tried to barge into my house, and tried to bribe me with gems, asking me to betray one of my guests to you. A guest who you've named after a pony who is not only a good friend of mine, but the bearer of the element of loyalty. Uh, yes? The Enclave Mayor didn't seem to like where this was going. I, on the other hoof, felt a sense of relief. I permitted myself to crack a smile. Spike reached forward with one claw, dropped it onto her back, pinning her against the floor. He leaned very, very close to the mare, then used another claw to lift up her visor so they were staring at each other, eye to eye. Spike snorted a gout of flame into the magical armor through the open visor, setting the Enclave mare on fire inside of her enclosed suit. She screamed and thrashed for an unbearably long second or two before perishing. Smoke curled out of the seams in the insectoid metal carapace. Damn! I heard Calamity bite back a strangled sound as I gagged from the smell. I didn't think I'd be eating cooked meat for a long time. Oh, goddesses, moaned Velvet Remedy. Spike raised his claw again. The other Enclave Pegasi fled into the night. Well, this is going to be trouble. We should stay. We should help. I ain't exactly gung-ho to start shooting at folk who could have been my kin, but I'll do what it takes to make this right. Spike shook his head. No, it'll be better if none of you are here when they return. Once they see that their prize is gone, they'll have less reason to press the matter. I looked at Spike worriedly. What if they... look deeper? I won't give them that option. Steelhoofs, now standing in the mouth of the cave, suggested, If there's something here you don't want them looking at, then we'd best make sure the Pegasi know we are somewhere else. He turned to Calamity. We should stay above the clouds for a bit. Calamity nodded. Get us have seen somewhere that ain't here. He looked up to me. What you say? Head back towards New Appaloosa, drop down and make a turn towards Junction R7 after we've been spotted? It would give us a chance to lighten our load, Velvet Remedy added approvingly. Get Calamity's workbench set up. Sorry, guys. I nodded. It was agreed. We would draw the Pegasi's attention away from Spike's cave. I just hoped they didn't start shooting at us. Although, if we did go up in an explosive blaze of glory, it might very well be worth it to keep the gardens of Equestria safe. Before we go, Velvet Remedy said to Spike, I did have one question you might be able to answer. My heart skipped a beat. Please, I begged silently, don't let it be about Fluttershy. Don't. Sure, Spike said amiably. What are those towers? Velvet asked, much to my relief. The tall, slender, white ones. As we were flying here, I saw several of them. They're the only things I've seen as tall as this mountain, and they're definitely pony-made. They were for the single pony project, Spike answered, speaking simultaneously with Calamity. Them's the sustainable Pegasi project, Calamity had stated. Spike and Calamity looked at each other. Okie dokie loki. The Single Pony Project? I asked. Calamity looked a touch hurt that I didn't turn to his expertise first. You mentioned that before. What was the project for? Spike opened his mouth, then paused. The dragon raised a claw, then stopped. Finally, he admitted. I actually have no idea. I spent all of my time with Twilight. I really don't know what the other ministries were up to. All I know is that it was called the Single Pony Project, that it was Rainbow Dash's idea, and that it was pretty much the only thing the Ministry of Awesome did. Only official thing, Steelhoves interjected. I turned to Calamity now. Sustainable Pegasi Project? Well, I can't say for sure it weren't the Single Pony Project at some point. Calamity chewed on what the dragon had just said. I was told otherwise. But it ain't like I got no reason to doubt anything just because the great Pegasus Enclave declares it be true. Velvet Remedy looked particularly pained at this spectacular mangling of proper grammar. And, if it were Rainbow Dash had came up with it, then I really doubt she would have meant for those towers to be used for what they're used for calling them now. Because right now, they're being used to help keep the Pegasus ponies isolated from the rest of y'all. 
How so? Calamity turned to Velvet Remedy. Remember when you asked me about what we ate up there, and I joked about cloud seeding? Velvet Remedy nodded. I recall that I was going to demand a proper answer later. Yeah, well, now you're going to get it, Calamity said. I don't know what them towers was immediately meant to do, but I know what the Enclave has repurposed them to do, and that's to enchant the clouds for miles around them so we can grow crops right up to the sky. I let out a whistle at that. From somewhere outside, Pyrolite whistled back. Made sense. No matter what the single pony project had been meant to be, towers were now being used to suit the purposes of the surviving ponies. The Pegasus ponies were using yeah, them above for agriculture above. I think. Homage was using them below to broadcast DJ ponies' music and messages across the wasteland, bringing you the truth no matter how bad it hurts. Mm -hmm. Red Eye was using one for. Goddesses knew what. Damn, I freaking care what you're talking about. drifted to Homage. I hadn't told Homage about Steelhoof's deception. He'd used DJ Pony's radio broadcast to spread his lie about Chief Grimstar. I had to wonder how some pony like Steelhoof managed to find himself in a romantic relationship with the mayor of the Element of Honesty. I expected that Homage would be personally offended. I didn't want to be the bearer of the message that caused her pain. But I didn't keep my mouth shut just because I didn't want to see her upset. She might feel provoked to air what I told her, even though I could offer no evidence to back it up. Okay, so it's obvious loyalty is Clint. Kindness is Velvet. Kindness is definitely Velvet because of the simple, simple fact that she is able to give kindness even if it's the one that hurts. Look what she did to help cure um, Little Pip. And we got Honesty. From, from homage, and I've, we've already made it, it apparent that laughter is is ditzy. So the only ones that are left are generosity and magic, which we do not know which are which. So I think generosity is Pip because Pip is willing to save, sacrifice his own her sorry her own life. Save others. That's my opinion. So magic is still on the table to who owns it. See, I don't think... Actually... If I think about it... Magic... 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 Who could be magic? And wait, what is Steel Hooves? Even though he's a ghoul, I don't think he has much of a virtue. Yet what good would that serve? It could be. More likely, I suspected she would choose not to air it. Like my struggles with addiction, or her real identity, sometimes secrets had their place. Homage understood that. That wonderful unicorn had more personal integrity than any pony I'd ever met, and I couldn't bear to put her in a morally uncomfortable position. Especially not after Monterey Jack. I was brought out of my reverie by a jab from Velvet Remedy's hoof. Still with us, little pip. I nodded. The others were already gathering back at the Sky Bandit. It was time to go. We wanted to be moving before the Pegasus Enclave returned. I trotted to the mouth of the cave, then looked back towards Spike. I guess this is it then. Watcher had helped me. Without him, I might never have survived. He helped give me purpose, a goal, and ultimately, friendship. But now, it was clear that we were not the ponies he was looking for, and he needed to focus his attention elsewhere. Spike nodded. I'll keep an eye open for you. We may talk again, but yes, this is it. Thank you, Spike. Thank you, little Pip. I don't think so. I turned and walked I don't out think of the cave. so. I think you are the eldest I was about to step into the sky I think end, you are. But I was hit by an epiphany. I can see it. Turning, I galloped back to the cave. Honestly, it was about more than just telling the truth. It was about integrity. Spike! I cried out. I know one of the other ponies you're looking for. Two black carapist pegasi were still hot on our trails as we broke beneath the cloud curtain. Ha! shouted Calamity, wings flapping hard as he hauled Makes the sidebands through the air at breakneck speed. Told you they wouldn't follow us below the clouds. Cowards. 
The Velvet Remedy was looking at the two demonic silhouettes behind us, her hair whipping across her face. They're still following us. What? Calamity glanced over his shoulder. Oh, horse apples. Somehow, he managed to pour on even more speed. We were pulling ahead. I saw the gemstones of the Enclave battle saddles flare you make a sonic and bolts of colored light God, shot past us. Shit. Thankfully, neither of these Pegasi had Calamity's aim. Calamity, could you kindly lose these ponies? Velvet asked with an almost seductive what smooth. Was this Bioshock? I'd really hate to get blown up today. Oh, Two more blasts of magical energy shot past us. One actually passing through one of the shattered windows of the passenger wagon and out the other, barely missing Pyrolight. The magical bird squawked and hid behind Velvet, who cooed at her comfortingly. Wow, Steelhoofs commented dryly. They really like you, don't they? Y'all can shut it now, Calamity barked at us. And hold on! I wrapped my forelegs around one of the poles between the wagon's bench seats. Velvet Remedy clamped down on one of the bits that dangled from the ceiling. From her expression, she immediately regretted it. I could only imagine the taste. Steelhoofs braced himself between benches. A moment later, Calamity took the Sky Bandit into a steep dive. Pyrelay bounced off the wagon's ceiling. She scrambled to bite down on Velvet Remedy's wind-thrashed mane before the wind threw her out the back window of the wagon. Bolts of colored light shot all around us. I think I screamed. The Enclave Pegasi broke off their pursuit about halfway to the ground. My legs were still shaking my hooves thankfully planted on firm ground. I watched as Velvet Remedy barged with Ditsy Doo outside the front gate of New Appaloosa, trading for spark batteries to replace the nearly drained ones in the Sky Bandit. I'm curious. They weren't allowed further, but the Ghoul Pegasus... I'm curious. What is this universe's equivalent to a Death Claw? I just thought about that. What is their universe equivalent of a Death Claw? Think about that. Like, they have all the normal monsters that are considered mutated. What about the Death Claw? Because no one knows what the fucking Death Claw is. This was more than happy to come out and greet us. For a moment, I didn't recognize the Lavender Filly who shyly followed behind her. My eyes widened as I realized it was Silver Bell, no longer painted in pink. She seemed... better. Being with a ditzy do was good for her. Silver Bell looked up, recognizing Velvet Remedy. She froze in her tracks. Hello, Silver Bell, Velvet Remedy said gently. You are looking beautiful this morning. Silver Bell looked at everything but, well, but at Velvet Remedy. I have someone you might like to meet, Velvet continued, her voice warm and accepting. Pyrelight, come out and meet Silver Bell. The little filly's eyes went wide at the sight of the majestic Balefire Phoenix. The emerald and gold creature landed next to her and cooed a friendly hello. The effect on Silver Bell was dramatic. Hmm. It was as if Pyrelay was truly the first beautiful thing the girl had ever seen. Calamity walked up next to me. Call me crazy, but after we go, I have to expect that filly to spend the next few days trying to make Avalusa about as pretty as that bird. I could so picture that. I looked up at Calamity. The rust-colored pegasus with the orange mane and black desperado hat was probably the closest friend I had. Not counting Amwich, who was all manner of closer, but much more than a friend. I know what you're thinking, Calamity stated. Don't you believe him? The Enclave has vested interest in making any pony who bucks their ideals into a monster. I believe you, I told him sincerely. I regularly put my life in the lives of those I loved in Calamity's care. I absolutely trusted him with this one, too. But, Calamity, if you're running from something, perhaps we can help. Calamity laughed. Little Pip, you should know me well enough by now to know that running away from things ain't my way. My friend turned his head towards the ever-present cloud cover. I flew towards something. They just didn't want to let me go. Nice place you got here, Steelhoof said as he looked around Junction R7. I couldn't be sure if he was being sarcastic or speaking truthfully. Home sweet train wreck. Steelhoofs eyed the turret defenses, then looked up at the tri-barreled magical energy cannon mounted on the roof of the train's incongruous engine. Oh, now that is a beauty. I could hear Calamity setting up his workshop. I looked around, but could not see where Velvet Remedy had wandered off to. 
Hopefully she was getting some sleep. I knew I needed some. Our next stop was going to be Philadelphia. I didn't know if we would actually find Red Eye there, but everything I had learned said that all of his slave operations were centered in that foul place. It was time to start putting some things right. Red Eye, I thought you killed her. Spike's words rang in my head. I know that as you travel, as you poke your nose into places and memories, you're going to hear and learn things about my twy. I had sworn I would remember, as he called it, the real heart of Twilight Sparkle. I couldn't imagine forgetting, now that I had seen it for myself. The sight of that Crusader mainframe, surrounded by the elements of harmony, sitting and waiting. Year after year, decade after decade, for the chosen ponies to put right things that were far beyond my ability to effect. I would say collecting dust, but they hadn't been dusty. Spike, I realized, had been dutifully tending to the elements of harmony and the mainframe. How hard would it be to remember if I had nothing like that sight to cling to? Right now, I had another private moment with Steelhoofs. I should make the best of it. I wanted to ask him about Applejack, but I didn't think we were ready for that conversation quite yet. I felt I would be prying into some place I hadn't earned the right to go. But I had other friends, including one I was worried was heading towards a shattering reality crash. I had no idea what to do for her, but I felt that knowing as much as I could before Hoof would give me the best chance to at least help her recover if I couldn't protect her from the tragic discovery. Steel Hooves. What happened to Fluttershy? The Steel Ranger stopped in mid-trot and turned his visor towards me. Depends on who you ask, he answered cryptically. No pony knows? I asked, having really hoped for a more definitive answer than that. Preferably one that I could mine for a little hope. Steelhoofs shook his head. Keep in mind, it's really hard to pin down what exactly happened to any particular pony. Skeletons don't come with name tags. And there were millions of ponies for whom the mega spells didn't even leave that. Some places like Splendid Valley and the Canterlot Ruins are still far too dangerous for proper expeditions. It's rare that you can say for certain what happened, even to a loved one. Oh dear. I nodded slowly. That said, most ponies, well, those who ever think of or even know about Fluttershy beyond the Ministry of Peace posters, believe that she was so devastated by what had happened to Equestria and to the world because of her efforts to force peace that she plodded into one of the really bad places and let nature tear her apart. Let Equestria do to her what she had done to it. I cringed. This wasn't what I had hoped for. There are other tales. Some claim she leapt to her death from the top of the Ministry of Peace in the Canterlot Ruins. Wasn't she a Pegasus? Steelhoofs nickered. Yes, but then just being outside in Canterlot would have been a death sentence enough. I looked at the ground. It just kept getting worse. And then there are ponies who say she wandered into the Everfree Forest and became a tree. Wait, what? I demanded. John you gotta bring that meme out. How could that even happen? You gotta bring that meme in this. Steelhoofs gave a shrug. Don't ask me. I've always been in the Fluttershy committed suicide camp myself. He snorted. Still, Everfree is a bizarre and twisted place. It became vastly more warped and deadly after the apocalypse. Although Luna knows why. It wasn't even hit. The Steel Ranger turned away. Only thing every pony can agree upon. Fluttershy lived through the apocalypse. Long enough, at least, for the full horror of it all. The death of innumerable ponies and animals. The poisoning and disfiguring of the land itself. To be ground into her soul. I collapsed on my haunches, feeling heartsick. This is the equestrian wasteland. It's nothing if not cruel. Well, this was... I have a theory. I don't know if it'll be true. Or it'll ever be true. But... If it's not true, or if it's not covered, here's a theory. Fluttershy became a ghoul. I think Fluttershy became a ghoul, and she's still trying to make up for it. That is my theory. It was a bust. Spike's asleep. I could wake him, but why would I do that to the poor guy? To wake up to all of this. Better to let him sleep. Have good dreams for just a little while longer. Hey, dragons can sleep for up to hundreds of years, right? 
Maybe Spike will get lucky and not wake up till Equestria's had time to heal. Although I don't know if 100 years is going to be enough. Seeing the sun like this, I can almost believe it never happened. Clouds hide the view below. I'm beginning to think that's the idea. They call me a traitor now. Me! After all I did for them. They turned their backs on Equestria, and they have the nerve to call me a traitor. They've even hired a mercenary now to hunt me down. Bring them back my head. Neck need not be attached, of course. She's good. The best. I'm better. And she knows it. A second voice sounded on the audio recording, gruffer than the mare's. Sure, which leaves a gal to wonder why you're just sitting up here and letting me find you. Hello, Gilda. The mare's voice replied, sounding tired. Sorry to have to end this way, Dash. No. No, you're not. Not really. Nah. Not really. Gilda, can I make one request? What? Can we sing it? One more time. Huh? Sing... Oh, you can't be serious. Just once. The second voice let out a long, suffering sigh. Ugh. Why? Because just for a moment, I want to remember an earlier, happier time. A time when the world didn't suck. <sighs> Fine. Only for you, Dash. The voice paused. One final time. But after that, you know I'm going to kill you. You can try. The two voices blended in odd harmony. Junior speedsters are our lives, skybound soars and dare. The audio recording abruptly cut off. The machine had reached its limit. Okay. This is the weird, the most interesting chapter I've had so far because this is improving my theories. And I just realized I need to catch up on um, the new episodes because I just noticed that the new episodes are out right now. So, right after this, I'm going to go watch those episodes. And you guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Fallout Equestria. And I hope to see you guys in the next episode. So, I'll catch you guys later. Stay nerdy, my friends. Bye-bye!